I had just gotten out of the academy back then. A new, inexperienced cop, eager to solve things, you know. It was the first really big case I had ever taken on. Until then, I had only dealt with petty thefts or scams here and there. It was an unusual day when I received that unusual call, the case that made me realize I was entering a world of no return. What's the situation? I remember hearing my superior say, as he adjusted his gun and we headed toward the car. I'm not exactly sure, replied the dispatcher. It seems like a woman found a body, or almost one, in the kitchen. An incident in the kitchen? Shouldn't they call the firefighters, or maybe the women's division? The old man laughed as we turned the corner of the station. We were in his old patrol car, the smell of leather still clinging to the front seats. The day was starting to darken, and a strange feeling began to settle in the air, as if the very environment was waiting for something ominous. We arrived at the scene in less than half an hour. The house was an old structure, with worn wood and dusty windows. The exterior, covered in ivy and shadows, seemed unaware of what was unfolding inside. The sound of a television turning on and off seemed to reverberate through the house, as if someone was trying to adjust the volume without success. When we entered, the first thing I noticed was the smell, a metallic acrid odour mixed with the stench of spoiled stew. It was a modest apartment in an old building with thin walls and a creaking hallway at every step. The kitchen was in disarray, with utensils scattered around and a stove covered in stains I preferred not to examine closely. The woman, still visibly shaken, sat in a corner of the living room, her hands trembling as she stared fixedly at a pressure cooker lying in the middle of the table. It was an ordinary-looking cooker, except for one disturbing detail, a thin layer of red liquid which seemed slightly more viscous than water. The liquid dripped down the edge and onto the table, pooling on the floor in a crimson puddle, that coagulated into small liquid chunks. I felt bile rise up my esophagus as I stared at it. It was hard to look away from that puddle, but what caught my attention more was how the deep red seemed to almost pulse as if it were alive, or as if small life forms like worms were moving within it. It was a miniature horror show, a scene straight out of a poorly filmed nightmare. While the woman continued to rock her knees, her gaze empty, I crouched to examine the cooker more closely. "'What the hell is this?' the old man asked, pulling a small plastic bag from his coat along with a swab. "'I have no idea,' I replied, still trying to comprehend the scene. The chief scooped up a good amount of the liquid and sealed it in the bag. "'This is going to the chemistry guys for analysis. "'Now, if you don't mind, miss,' he said, pulling a notepad from his other pocket, "'could you give your version of events?' As the interrogation began, I paid even closer attention. The pot was cold to the touch, the metal still gleaming with a chrome shine, but the liquid inside seemed to have a consistency of its own, almost like a thick, dark gel. The smell was stronger here, and I could taste the metallic tang forming on my tongue as I breathed through my mouth, trying to avoid the odour. The woman slowly lifted her eyes, still trembling, and began to speak in a fragile, almost inaudible voice. I... I was just making dinner. A pressure cooker, you know. A simple pot roast. When the steam started to escape, the noise was strange, different, and then this started to leak out. This... this liquid... soon. She paused for a long moment, her gaze fixed on the pot, as if the object had a life of its own. I thought it was some kind of accident, maybe some ingredient that spilled, but the smell, the smell wasn't of food burning, and the liquid, it didn't stop. It just kept coming more and more, and when I opened it, I saw an eye looking right at me. I could see its nerve endings, and, and there was so much blood. The room grew even colder after she said that. 
My arms were covered in goosebumps, and I glanced at the old man, waiting for him to say something. He just kept that serious expression, his pencil moving slowly over the notepad, recording every word that came out of the girl's mouth. And I? he asked, his voice firm but lower than usual. Maybe even he was feeling uneasy. The woman nodded, visibly disturbed. Yes, an eye. A human eye. I know how that sounds, but I saw it. It was there, floating in that liquid, as if it had been cooked with the meat. She closed her eyes, trying to hold back the tears. I ran to the phone and called you, and since then I've been standing here staring at the pot. I moved closer to the object, still trying to process what I was hearing. The lid was slightly ajar, but not enough for something large to come out. Yet the liquid kept pooling around, and its reddish sheen was making me nauseous. How could there be so much of that liquid? Even for a large pot, there shouldn't be that much volume. I leaned in a little more, the flashlight on my belt illuminating the inside of the object. The flashlight's beam lit up the interior of the pot as sweat trickled down my temple, and it revealed something that shouldn't have been there. A shiver ran down my spine as my eyes focused on something partially submerged in the viscous red liquid. The reflection glimmered briefly, like a moist membrane, and then I saw it. It looked like a long strip, some sort of tape. My eyes narrowed as the flashlight revealed more of that thing. It was definitely tape, the kind of magnetic reel you'd expect to find in a cassette. It was soaked in the liquid, tangled in a bizarre and grotesque mess, as if it had been cooked there along with the meat and blood. I straightened up slowly, trying to process what I was seeing. This didn't make any sense, no sense at all. There's... there's a tape inside the pot, I said, barely believing the words coming out of my mouth. The old man stopped writing for a moment, lifting his eyes from the notebook. He looked at me, then at the pot. His face remained expressionless, but I knew he was also trying to understand. Do you think someone put it there? he asked, his voice calm but with a slight tone of suspicion. I don't know. It seems... it seems like it's part of all this. As if it formed there. I touched the tape with the tip of my fingers, and a shiver ran down my arm. The tape seemed to tremble. It was slightly warm, like someone's skin. The young woman, who had been silent until then, began to sob quietly. I swear... I swear I just wanted to make dinner. I don't know where this came from. I don't know what's happening. I looked up, and for a second, my eyes met hers. The depth of her despair was almost palpable. Something was very, very wrong in that house, and somehow the answer was in that pot. Okay. Do you have a tape player? I asked, a bit unsettled. She just nodded. And some kind of sedative? My partner asked, receiving the same nod in response. I bent down again, my heart pounding in my chest. With the tip of my fingers, I slowly pulled the tape, trying not to spill more of that grotesque liquid onto the floor. When the tape was completely out, I realized it was much larger than it seemed. Do you think it's safe to put this in a cassette player? I asked, my voice quieter than usual. The old man simply nodded, a flicker of curiosity appearing in his tired eyes. Well, it could be a very elaborate prank, but still, I don't know, there's something very strange about this. He helped the woman take a small pill while one of the aides led her to the bedroom. I wasn't expecting a movie night, but here we go, he joked. The room was a mess. I walked over to the small cassette player on top of the TV, careful not to step on any of the scattered objects. The device looked like it hadn't been used in a long time, covered in a thin layer of dust. I carefully picked up the tape, holding it as if it were an archaeological artifact. The texture of the magnetic reel was cold and slippery, still a bit damp from the viscous liquid that had covered it. 
The tape seemed to be in good condition after being cleaned, but it carried an unsettling feeling. I placed the tape in the player and pressed play. The TV began to hiss, and soon the screen showed a blurry, distorted image. The sound of static filled the room, and the tape took a few seconds to stabilize the image. The company's jingle played, echoing muffled as it met the carpet's surface. The tape finally stabilized, and the image revealed the kitchen where we had been just minutes earlier, but much tidier. The colors were pale, almost faded. The camera seemed to be held by someone, filming in first person, trembling slightly, as if the cameraman were nervous or anxious. The angle showed the kitchen counter, the clean countertop, and a set of utensils neatly arranged. It looked like an everyday scene of someone about to prepare a meal. The camera moved closer to the sink, and a hand entered the frame, filling the pressure cooker with water. The sound of the liquid bubbling echoed through the silent room, and something about the way that hand moved, stiff and uncoordinated, already made me uneasy. The skin looked strange. It was covered with small wrinkles and folds, like when someone is very overweight and quickly loses pounds, leaving some sagging skin. The cameraman picked up a knife, cutting green leaves with precision, but I couldn't identify what kind of plant it was. It wasn't something common, and the imaginary smell of herbs seemed to invade my mind, mixing with the metallic taste I still had in my mouth. The cut was clean, methodical. The person knew exactly what they were doing. Suddenly the camera moved, abruptly turning towards a corner of the kitchen that had not been shown until then. My heart stopped for a second. The woman... The same woman who had greeted us at the door of the house was there, tied up and gagged. Her eyes were wide with terror, her wrists firmly bound to a wooden chair. She looked pale but alive, her body trembling as if she already knew what was about to happen. The camera focused on her for a long, disturbing moment, capturing every tear falling from her eyes, every drop of sweat dripping down her desperate face. Then. Without warning, the hand holding the knife approached the woman and, with an eerie calmness, began to descend along the side of her face. The flesh seemed to peel off easily, as if the skin were just a mere wrapping. Red, fresh meat was carefully stripped away, and a wet, nauseating sound filled the room as the cameraman undressed the woman, peeling her piece by piece. I felt a wave of intense nausea seeing this. The old man beside me also held his breath. The strips of flesh were meticulously placed into the pressure cooker, along with the chopped leaves, the liquid bubbling slowly as it became redder and redder. The scene was a grotesque banquet of horror. The woman's eye, the same one she had mentioned earlier, finally being torn from its socket and tossed into the boiling broth. The close-up was almost unbearable, the eye floating there, the blood vessels from its base still twitching slightly, as if it were still alive. The cameraman remained silent throughout the entire process, the muffled sound of the boiling liquid being the only noise on the tape besides his strange rapid breathing in the background almost imperceptible. Whatever was holding the camera, I was sure it wasn't human. The scene then abruptly changed. Now the camera was in front of a mirror. The reflection was an image that has stuck with me for the past thirty years. The lady of the house was holding the camera. She looked different, almost like one of those poorly made dolls. She began adjusting the skin on her face, pulling and stretching the newly placed pieces. Her form was grotesque, almost liquid. Her hands trembled as they adjusted the skin over the flesh, like an actor preparing to go on stage. And then the sound came. It was a voice, but not a human one. At first it was like a guttural noise, 
a sound that reverberated against the walls of the room, inhuman and distorted. The creature, however, seemed to be practicing, trying to mold that sound into something resembling a human voice. Little by little, the sounds began to take shape, becoming recognizable. It was the woman's voice. The creature was practicing, mimicking her speech, each syllable carefully adjusted until the sound became identical to the woman who greeted us at the door. The woman who called the station. The creature was rehearsing, repeating common phrases, testing the intonation, the words dripping from its grotesque throat as if preparing to deceive everyone. The tape ended with a sharp click. The screen went black and the sound of static filled the room. I looked at the old man and he looked at me, the tension palpable in our gaze. This is definitely not some damn prank, he finally muttered. Before I could say anything, however, I froze in place. I could feel the cold creeping up my spine, and despite the humid, stifling air of the room, my knees tightened and trembled. It was the sound of the door, upstairs. The creak was short, sharp and steady, followed by the voice of our hostess. Detective, she said, almost singing. The woman's voice echoed through the house, and a chill pierced me like an icy blade. The tone was too light, almost sweet, but it carried an unsettling sense of wrongness, as if something wasn't right with it. I looked at the old man, who had already stood up and turned toward the stairs leading upstairs. His hand was firmly on his holster, fingers hesitating. Detective, is everything all right down there? Do you need anything? The woman's voice was getting closer, and each word seemed more artificial, like a poorly edited recording. The creaking of the floorboards above indicated her slow, calculated steps descending the stairs. I moved closer to the old man, and with a quick gesture signalled for him to turn off the tape. The static hiss ceased, and the silence that followed was deafening. The sound of footsteps drew nearer and nearer. My heart pounded like a drum, echoing in my chest. I need you to head to the car, the old man whispered. Call for backup. He tried to remain calm, but it was clear even he didn't fully understand what was happening. Part of me wanted to obey and run out of there, but a morbid curiosity and fear kept me rooted in place. The woman finally appeared at the top of the stairs, or at least her head tilted her body hidden behind the wall. Her eyes seemed darker, I'd even say ravenous, and she maintained a polite smile on her face. The woman's smile was wrong in so many ways it was hard to explain. It wasn't just the forced expression, but the way her lips curled at too sharp an angle, revealing teeth that looked wrong, as if they were out of place. Are you okay down there? Her voice sounded sweet, almost childlike, but there was something unbearably disturbing about the way the words dragged on. The old man stepped forward, keeping calm, but his hand never left the holster. His voice remained firm and steady. The captain, a burly man, with a face marked by experience, found me leaning against the patrol car, still out of breath. What the hell happened here, Santos? He asked, his eyes scanning the street before settling on me with a mix of concern and suspicion. There was... there was something in there. A woman. I don't know what she was, but the old man is in there. He was with me. And she... she moved in an impossible way, like an animal, not a person. The words came out trembling, broken. I tried. I tried to help, but he stayed behind. The captain frowned, absorbing what I said with skepticism. Stay here, Santos. We'll check it out. He signaled for the officers to move forward while I remained by the patrol car, my hands still shaking. I stayed there for a few more minutes, unable to think straight. Everything seemed frozen, except for the nagging feeling that something terrible was still coming. Finally, the captain returned with a grim expression. Santos! There's no one in there. My stomach churned. 
What do you mean? The old man was there. He had the gun. And the woman. She. He cut me off with a sharp gesture. The house is empty. No sign of a struggle. No gunshots. No bodies. Neither the woman nor the old man were found. Not even the pan. The place is clear. My mind spun. That's... that's impossible. I saw it. I was there. The shots. The captain looked at me with a mix of skepticism and growing concern. Santos, I need you to calm down and explain to me what happened. We didn't find anything. I opened my mouth to speak, but the words failed. The world around me seemed to fall apart, and a sense of emptiness enveloped me. I had been there, right? The case was closed about six months after the incident. I never saw the old man, the woman, or that damn blood again. At least, not in person. But in my dreams, oh, in these thirty years, there hasn't been a single week where they didn't pay me a visit. And I might have taken this with me to the grave as a strange story no one cares about anymore, but something strange happened this past month. A new colleague joined our team. His name was Ribeiro, a man with a serious look and a reserved demeanor. He always seemed to be lost in his own thoughts. The first time I saw him was at the station when he walked into a meeting. His presence was, uh, unsettling. The next morning, when I went to introduce myself to him, I noticed something odd. Ribeiro was wearing short sleeves, and as I shook his hand, I saw something strange. His hands had folds, just like the ones I had seen during those disturbing moments. The folds were almost imperceptible, but they were there. A cold chill ran down my spine. A week later, the peak of my panic occurred. Upon arriving at work in the morning, I was confronted with a pressure cooker sitting on my desk. It was brand new, gleaming under the office lights, but it was impossible not to associate it with the terror I had experienced. My heart began to race, and a metallic taste flooded my mouth. I got rid of it immediately, throwing it into the dumpster behind the department. I even asked others if they had seen who did it, but no one had. Honestly, I have reasons to suspect Ribeiro, since his desk is directly in front of mine. In fact, I believe he did it on purpose, knowing I would suspect him. I think this because right now, as I write this, he's staring at me through his computer. And as the last colleague says goodbye and leaves, I can hear him starting to murmur something, as if rehearsing my voice.